And that's said, I and Matt might have a good class, but <laughs> this is much better. <laughs> this, is, this is much better. Um, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right in and get going. Our God and our Father, we thank you for another day and for all of your blessings. You are and continue to be so good to us. And for that, we are appreciative and grateful. We are so thankful for Jesus, without whom we could do nothing, but through whom, Father, we can do all things. And we pray that you'll bless this good congregation, the leadership here, Matt, and all of those who labor uh, to do your will here. We pray that you'll bless us in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> this material that we're going to discuss over the next couple of days is a book that I'm working on, almost done with it. Give you just a little background as to how we got here. Uh, I grew up, we use that expression, I grew up in the church. I think you know what we mean is my, I was reared in, in the Lord's church. We've never known anything else. My mother obeyed the gospel when we were very young. And I only tell you that to give you a sense of how many sermons I've heard through the years and growing up hearing sermons. Uh, I'm not, I don't mean in any way to impugn the good preachers that we had growing up because they were very good men and they did a fantastic job. Uh, everything we learned, we learned growing up from them and in that place. And it's just that through my personal experience, I was, uh, God was shaped in a particular way in my mind. Uh, we heard a lot of sermons on heaven. We've heard a lot of sermons on hell. And I feel like more on hell than on anything else, ultimately. And uh, in my young mind, that made God very difficult and challenging to please. And as we touched on last night, I was one of those people that struggled with whether or not you're ever doing good enough, whether or not you're ever uh, uh, living right enough. And the struggle lasted throughout my young adult life, into my adult life, all the way into my preaching life. And I found myself preaching the very God that I had been taught and had come to understand, which is one of the things that I suggest to people, and that is preachers preach the God they know, and members respond to the God that's preached. And so if we then present God in a particular way, members then will respond to that God. God's people are the best people on the planet. I have found that to be the case. I believe it sincerely. I don't mean they're good on their own. I just mean their love for the Lord, their conviction to truth and their willingness to strive to live for him. They are indeed the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And what that means is no matter what's preached nearly and no matter how it's presented, those people will imbibe that and then process that and then try to go out and live that. And so as faithful as they might be, if they hear your sins and iniquity have separated you from your God, they will nod in agreement and say, yep, I'm messing this thing up. I'm trying as good as I can, no matter what's preached. And over time, you do that long enough, you'll begin to be just like I was. And it's a very difficult trying life to live that way. I was uh, preaching in um, Avondale for some time I was sitting in a Bible class and uh, someone else was up teaching the class and they were talking about prayer. And I don't exactly remember the sentence that they said. I wish I could, but I don't. What I remember is the conclusion in my mind led me to believe they said something that meant this. If you get what you want, then that was God's will. If you don't get what you want, then that wasn't God's will. And I sat there and listened to that and I just thought that can't be right. There's no way that God's will can be determined based on the outcome of my prayer life. That's not how it works. Now, unfortunately, as I sat there, I didn't actually know how it worked. I just knew that can't be right. And what that did was send me to study. So I said, I'm gonna go find out the will of God and then I'll know what the expression means in 1 John 5 when he says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, we have our petition. That is a couple of verses of confidence and assurance. And I just need to know what the will of God is. Well, I went to search for the will of God. On my search, as I was looking for his will, I found myself focusing on him quite a bit. Because if anybody's going to tell me what his will is, he is. And so I found myself studying and finding God. 
And that's really how the study developed, though I, I diverted my attention from the will of God to knowing God. And it's in that study that I realized all of those years of anguish and all of those years of struggle was the result of me actually not knowing God. I knew a lot about God. and I had heard a lot about God. And I had listened to a lot about God. But on a personal basis, from my own study, I didn't know God. And the God that I found in my study was very different than the one I had tried to live for and with in my growing up years. So that, in a nutshell, is our study, getting to know God. I fear that a lot of people who struggle the way I did are in the same boat with regards to God. I don't know if you're allowed to ask questions in these classes, but I'm okay with it. So if you're okay with it, and if you have a question, you feel free to ask and jump right in anytime you want to. You follow me so far, does any of that make sense to you? I have a saying at home, it goes like this, yes, so, yes, no, maybe so. So you, you let me know which one of those it is. So in talking about getting to know God, let's begin with that. Uh, there is another uh, entire lesson before this one, but we will run out of days before we run out of material. So let me give you an encapsulation of that one very quickly, and then we'll jump into this one. If you have your Bibles, and I'm glad that you do, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's talk very briefly about this lesson. This would normally be the introduction to the material probably most frequently used in a Sunday morning Bible class session, and then lead into the AM and PM. This session is entitled, How to Know God. How do I know God? And the point of that lesson is this. There is no way to know God without the revelation of God. You can know that God is. The Bible teaches and affirms that. You can from creation. Passages like Psalm 19, 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. The Bible even gives creation life. It personifies creation. And so if you follow those six verses, it will make creation have a voice. And it will say of creation, day after day utters speech. Night after night, it shows wisdom. And then it will say there is no voice. There is no place, no line where their voice is not heard. He's talking about creation. And he is saying the sun, the moon, the stars arise and shine in the, the sky and demonstrate by their actions the glory of God. We could know there is a God from creation. What we could not know is the character of God. What we could not know is the individuals within the Godhead. We could not know of the Word or Jesus. We could not know of the Holy Spirit. We could not know there are three members of the Godhead from creation. Can't learn that from there. In that same Psalm, verse seven says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. Since God has made us at the very least dual beings, we have a body and a soul. That soul can only be reached by the revelation of God. And that's what makes this lesson important by way of introduction. There is no other way to do this. You can't feel God. You can't experience God. You can't go say, I'm going to go out on the dock and I'm going to look at nature and experience God. You will experience something, but it won't be God. You will have a wonderful time and some beautiful scenery given to you by God, but you won't be experiencing God. You won't feel him. The Bible emphasized learning God. And so scripture is the only way to do that. First Corinthians chapter two makes that abundantly clear. The context begins back in chapter one and verse 18. It extends at the very least into chapter two, possibly all the way over to chapter four. From verse 18 in chapter one, the apostle Paul is talking about wisdom. He's making a contrast between human wisdom and divine wisdom. He's talking about the preaching that he does. 
and how that is affecting the Jews and the Gentiles. He says, the Greeks seek a sign, the Gentiles, the Greeks, those people seek a sign. They, well, they want wisdom rather. It's the Jews that seek the sign. But the Jews and the Greeks are both missing the Christ. It's foolishness to the Greeks that God would take on flesh and die for the sins of the world. That's foolishness to them, not the way they would have drawn it up, not their human wisdom. They wouldn't have come up with that, and therefore, to them, it's foolishness. On the other hand, for the Jews, it's a stumbling block. They stumbled at the stone that God made the chief cornerstone. They stumbled at Jesus, and as a result of that, they missed out on the Savior. And so Paul goes all the way from chapter 1, verse 18, to the end of the chapter, talking about how God used preaching to demonstrate his wisdom and to share his wisdom and why some people missed out on that. He ultimately says in verse 29, the reason for this was that so that no man would boast in his presence. No one can boast before God that they figured out the things that God was doing. No one knew it, which he's going to say in chapter two. Now, as you get into chapter two, he continues the same thought. And that thought has to do with wisdom and his preaching. And so let's begin reading there. We'll just read it rather quickly and I'll try to get out of this lesson in the next three or four minutes. And then we'll get to the lesson at hand. Paul says, when I came to you, brethren, I came not with superiority of speech or of wisdom, claim unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, that is human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. The reason for that is in verse five, so that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the wisdom of God or the power of God. Paul says, yet we do speak wisdom. So he shifts very quickly. We're not talking about the wisdom of men, he says, but we do speak wisdom. That wisdom, he says, among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom. <clears throat> How would the apostle speak God's wisdom? He's going to tell us here momentarily. He says, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestinated before the ages to our glory, the wisdom that none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Well, how then does one come to know them, Paul? Paul says, but God has revealed them unto us. You'll want to note the word us, the apostles, the prophets, those individuals who were given divine revelation. How did they get it? God revealed them unto us by his spirit. That's exactly what Jesus promised. You remember, if you would go back and read John 13 over to John 17. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you read those four chapters, if you have a red letter edition Bible, what you will see is a lot of red. Jesus does most of the talking. This is his last address before he goes into the garden and prays and is ultimately betrayed and crucified. This is the last time with the apostles. And this is that section where he spends a lot of time talking about them, about his departure. And he says, I'm going away. He says it several times, that great passage in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says that because in chapter 13, they are saddened that he just told them, I'm leaving, I'm going away. Well, their hearts are troubled. They're heavy laden, they're burdened down. Jesus said, don't worry. You believe in God, believe also in me. And when you keep reading through John 14, 15, 16, and he'll say, I'll send you another comforter. I'll send you the comforter. He will guide you into all truth. Well, that's the promise to the apostles. The Holy Spirit is going to come and to reveal to them the mind of God. Paul says, that's what we do. That's the wisdom that we preach. He says that wisdom was in a mystery. <clears throat> Nobody knew it. Now he goes on to say in verse number 11, by way of illustration and explanation, he says, for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. When you think about the word deep, think about the, the ocean and the depths and the idea of being way 
down, hidden, and something that's very, very deep. That's what he says with regards to the mind of God. The Spirit searches the deep things of God. The Spirit does that. And then the Spirit reveals them to us. It's verse 10 and 11 and 12, though, 9 and 12, that's really interesting and significant to us because it has to do with how we come to know things. Paul asked the question, what man knows the things of a man, another man, except the man's spirit, which is in him? In other words, we don't have the capacity to read each other's mind. You have a spirit, I have a spirit. What's in your spirit? What's in your mind? I don't know. I can't look at you and read your mind. Nobody can do that. Whatever is in your mind is a mystery to me. It's hidden. It's unknown to me. How will I come to know it when you reveal it to me in words? Now, once you tell me what you're thinking, now I know. Sometimes you hear people say, I know what you're thinking. It's not exactly true. <laughs> that would go against 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 12. No man can do that. No man knows the things of another man. No man except his own spirit. This is the challenge for us. Sometimes somebody will tell us what they're thinking and we'll say, no, you're not. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, you have to believe their words because that's how we come to know. Now, Paul's point ultimately is this. If you and I can't read each other's mind and we can't, which one of us could read the mind of God? Not one of us. Now, sometimes when you say that, and I agree wholeheartedly, we say none of us, we look around a room like this and we think none of us. But please, <laughs> make the us a little bigger. As in, start with Adam and come forward to the last baby born and then move forward to every human being who will ever exist on the planet. No man knows the things of God. No man can. If God doesn't reveal it to us, then we couldn't know it. It's what makes the book so important. Because if you close the book, you are left with creation. There is a God, yes. But tell me about the plan of redemption. Tell me about the Holy Spirit without opening your Bible, with no reference to scripture. The way we come to know God is his word. Now, saying that to Christians, A, they already believe it. Here is the rub, though. When you live the life that I lived before, an amazing thing will happen to you. You actually won't read the Bible <laughs> because you will be convinced in the end it won't make a difference. Now, when I say you won't read it, I don't mean that absolutely because you will read it, but you'll read it out of some sense of duty. You'll read it out of some sense of obligation and ought. You will read it almost in the sense that I had better do it or else. And as a result of that, your reading will be ineffectual. It just won't profit you much. Did I read the Bible when I was a child growing up, up to the point of being a preacher? Yes. And it's an amazing thing. When you think wrong about God, you can read the Bible and miss God. You can read the Bible and miss the central character of the Bible. And it's that, that is the problem. So now that we are, and we've introduced the thought, that is the only way to know God is his word. Without this, we can't know him. What does it say about him? What is it that we need to learn about him? So that's how we get to know God. Now then, in the time we have remaining, which is about four hours and 33 minutes, <laughs> or about 35, 40 minutes, let's talk then about what, what the Bible says about him, getting to know God. Two people in the Bible, at least in my mind and up to this point in my knowledge, two people use the exact expression, I knew thee. They said they knew God. Uh, let's talk about those two people. And then in the time we have remaining, let's talk about what God says about himself. So first of all, one is in the Old Testament. If you'll go back to the book of Jonah. If you haven't read the book of Jonah in a while, it's a great read, four chapter book, uh, fantastic account, 17 in the first, 10 in the second, that's 27, 10 in the third, 37 and 11. 
in the fourth. So 48 verses. It wouldn't take you long to read 48 verses. I'm told that you could read about 66 verses in 15 minutes. That's what I'm told. So you could get this done in 15 minutes. Not a long read and a great read. The book of Jonah. Jonah is an individual who said he knew God. However, whatever Jonah knew about God, though accurate in its portrayal, had a very uh, wrong uh, effect on him and an unfortunate one. He says it in chapter four. The Bible says, but it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. And so in his anger, he prayed to God. Don't know if you've ever prayed to God in anger, but Jonah did. Verse number two says, he prayed to the Lord and said, please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish for I knew thee. I knew you. Well, what did you know, Jonah? Jonah says, I knew you. That you were, he says, a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who rents, relents from uh, concerning calamity. King, King James might say repents of the evil uh, that he was going to do or something to that effect. Question, in light of what Jonah says about God, what's the problem? I mean, could you describe God better? been merciful and gracious and kind and long-suffering and uh, willing to uh, forgive and let people uh, not be punished. I mean, there's, there's hardly a better way to describe God than Jonah does. But Jonah says, I knew you. Well, he knows that about God, but for whatever reason, and there are probably many, Jonah is not very happy about God being that way, which indicates that Jonah does not understand something about God. In this book, everybody in the book ultimately gets delivered. Everybody. This book opens by God telling Jonah that the sins of Nineveh has come up before me and he is to arise and go to Nineveh and preach. Jonah is one of the few prophets you'll find in the Bible who did not want to preach. Not many of those. Jonah is also one of the few prophets in the Bible who even when he did preach, he didn't want to be successful. You probably can't imagine that, a preacher who gets up and says, I hope today nobody responds. <laughs> I hope today none of y'all come down and obey God. I don't want a single one of y'all to do it. That's Jonah. It's a strange kind of deal. Why was Jonah that way? He's that way because of who the Assyrians are and how cruel and how barbaric they were and how terrible they were with regards to how they treated other people. They were cruel and they, they were warring people and they were destructive in their nature. And God said, go preach to them. Tells you something about God, I hope. Jonah enters the ship with these mariners in chapter one and Jonah goes to sleep and the mariners come into a, a Bible says, but God brought up a strong wind and, and the wind begins to rock the boat and the men cry out to their God and they wake Jonah up and they ask him, why is this happening? And Jonah tells them, ultimately, it's me. And Jonah says, if you want it to be solved, then throw me overboard. And the Bible says, but the men rode harder. You know, we could stop 45 times in this book and make points of emphasis and that would be one. Whenever God says something, humanity tends to roll harder against it. We are trying to get ourselves to shore contrary to God's will. So often in life, people find themselves rowing harder against what God said. The solution to the problem is to throw Jonah overboard. Instead, they keep him on board and row harder. Well, the ship is ultimately going to be broken because we can't defeat God. God's going to win. They come to that realization and ultimately they do throw Jonah overboard and the sea calms and those men are saved. Well, now that Jonah is in the water, Jonah is swallowed by a great fish. Who prepared the fish? God did. In fact, it looks like a, a, a chess game or a checker game where one move is made and a counter move is made and another move is made and a counter move is made. And every move Jonah makes, God has an answer. Jonah gets on the boat, flees the Tarshish, God brings the wind. They throw Jonah overboard, God prepares a fish. Well, if you read chapter two, Jonah is now in the fish. I don't know if you've ever been in a fish. <laughs> no, no, nobody's ever been in a fish. Well, you can't experience or know the experience of Jonah, but you sure could read it. I thought about it, and uh, the best I could come up with is it's wet in there. That would be my guess. Uh, my second guess would be it's dark in there. 
That would be my second guess. My third guess would be if he swallowed a whole man, he probably swallowed one or two other things, <laughs> which means he may have company in there. I've tried to imagine the weeds and the other things bumping up against me in the water, in the dark, in the I don't know, but if you read Jonah chapter two, Jonah says some of those things. And Jonah now in that position, you know what he does? He says, I cried out to the Lord. Notice Jonah chapter two. He says in verse number, uh, verse number seven, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you and to your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will repay. Salvation is of or from the Lord. Verse number 10 says, the fish spit out Jonah. Chapter three, Jonah runs to Nineveh. I mean, would you have run, you think, or would you have just kind of sauntered along? No, Jonah makes, I believe, what is a three-day journey in one day, one day's time. And when he gets there, he preaches what, I, again, I believe, an eight-word sermon in verse number three. I know sometimes you want preachers to preach shorter. Eight words, though. I mean, that's it. Yet 40 days and then it will be overthrown. Let us stand and be dismissed. That's the whole sermon. That's it. <laughs> 40 days, none of it will be overthrown. And an amazing thing happened. Everybody repented. You read chapter three, and as one person put it, from the king to the pauper, everybody, the king made a decree, let everybody. That's the problem. We're preaching too long. <laughs> Just an eight-word sermon. That's all we need. <clears throat> Everybody repents. You remember those mean, barbaric Assyrians who were bloodthirsty and heinous people. They heard eight words and they repented. Well, when they repented, let me ask you, what was God supposed to do? That's how we enter chapter four. There's the word it in the first verse. The Bible says, but it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. What's the it? All of those events in chapter three, they changed, they repented. If you know God, what you're supposed to know is if an individual will repent, God will forgive him. You're supposed to know that if you know God. Does it matter what they did? No. Does it matter to you? You see, at some point in this series of lessons, we get down to the point where our ways need to be God's ways. That may be the third or fourth lesson, but the point is this, when you learn God, the goal and the point of learning God is ultimately so you can live like God. And there will be times in your life where you can begin to see the inconsistencies inconsistencies and the incompatibility with me and God. You are seeing it here with Jonah. Jonah knows what God and who God is, but Jonah doesn't want that given to the Assyrians. He wants it for him, but not for them. Well, he actually doesn't know God then because God wouldn't turn away anybody who repented. Ezekiel 18, 23, God asked the question, have I any delight in the wicked parish? He has no delight that the wicked perish. He would rather they turn. And if they turn, he will forgive. Now, as you also read through this book, one of the things you'll find is God is Jonah's father. And so the book reads very much like a father trying to teach his son how to properly deal with life and people and see it the way the father sees it. I don't know if that ever comes about. We get to the end of the book and Jonah is still sitting on a hill looking down at Assyria, hoping it appears, hoping that they'll change and go back to their evil ways. And you hear God talking to Jonah, again, much like a father. That conversation in chapter four, just listen to it a little bit. Notice verse number six. 
And so the Lord God appointed a plan that grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better for me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? He said, I have a good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished in a night. Should not I have compassion on Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand and many animals? You want to learn something about God, you would read verse 10 and 11 again and listen to what God says. Jonah, you were concerned about a plant. You didn't plant it. You were concerned about a plant. It came up in the night. It withered in the night. It's nothing. Now, shouldn't I? God says about three or four things in that verse. He says, number one, it's a great city, which tells me God watches humanity build things. God assessed this city, and he says it's a great city. And if you do a little research on the city of Nineveh, you'll find that to be the case. It was a huge city. God called it great. Shouldn't I have compassion on this great city? But more importantly than the city and its building, he said inside of that city, there's more than 120,000 people who can't tell their left hand from their right hand, usually a way to describe children, not old enough to discern the difference between left and right. Now, if you have 120,000 children, well, then add the parents. They're inside the city, Jonah. Shouldn't I have been concerned about them? But then God adds, and there are many animals down there. <laughs> Does God care for animals? At the very least, he notes them. Jonah, there's a bunch of animals down there, more important than a plant. There's a bunch of humans in that place. And there's this huge, great city. It reads like a father trying to teach his son to come over and to see things properly. Jonah said, I knew you. Interestingly, everybody in the book gets delivered. The mariners get delivered in chapter one. The Assyrians get delivered in chapter three. Who gets delivered in chapter two? By which God? The same gracious, long-suffering, and abundant. You do appreciate that in chapter two, Jonah is in disobedience. You do appreciate that Jonah has gone against God's word. God said, go preach. Jonah ran the other way. Jonah is in the fish because of disobedience. But when Jonah repents, I cried out to the Lord and he heard me. I will pay my vows. Salvation is of the Lord. And what does God do? He delivers Jonah. Jonah said, I knew you. What Jonah knows about God, at the very least, though accurate in his description, is terribly flawed in his application. That's one man who said he knew God. Who's another? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 25. You have any thoughts or questions about that? Matthew chapter 25 is where we find the other man. We're on our way to two more points. We need to talk about this man, and then we need to talk about what God says about himself. I can't do that in eight words. <laughs> I don't know that you and I are much like Jonah. I don't know that. I don't know anybody really well enough to know if they feel a particular way about somebody else so strongly that they don't want to, to see them saved. In fairness, however, if you want to walk a mile in Jonah's shoes, I suppose you would need to go stand in some other historical events and some other historical shoes to try to appreciate it. Suppose you lived um, in the South and God wanted you to go preach to the North during the Civil War or vice versa. You lived in the North and God wanted you to go preach to the South. How would you have felt about that? Maybe if you were uh, a Jew in the concentration camps and God said, go preach to the Germans, go preach to them. Maybe if you were enslaved and God said, go preach to those who own you. You see, if you want to walk a mile in Jonah's shoes, well, in fairness, at the very least to Jonah, 
I don't want to stand before you and say, I have no concept of how Joan could be so angry at somebody he wouldn't want to see them saved. You just have to stand maybe somewhere akin to what it would have been like for a Jew to go preach to the Assyrians and want to see them saved in light of their behavior toward the Jews and everybody around them. I think I owe Jonah that to tell you that much. Does that sound fair to y'all? Uh, I don't know if that's how we feel. I don't know what we would do in those dynamics, but that's closer to what Jonah is going through. That said, where most of us probably are if we struggle in this area and certainly where I was as a younger person growing up is Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, there is this parable uh, beginning in verse 14 that we refer to as the parable of the talents. The talents in the parable is not ability to do a thing well. That's not the talents. The talent is money, a monetary amount. The master has money. He's going to distribute that to his servants. That's what's involved. Now, there is within this parable one servant that also says, I knew you to the master. You can find him in verse 24 and verse 25. The one who also had received he, the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid. And I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, thy hast there that is thine. Now, I generally at this point ask people to uh, do some self introspection with themselves. You don't have to answer out loud. I'm not asking for any show of hand or any indi indication verbally. But I do think you should ask and answer yourself. Do you identify with this man? This man said, I knew thee that you are hard. And a lot of people feel that way about God. It's just not popular. And so we don't say it. What we end up doing is suffering in silence. But for many people, every day is a struggle. For many people, Christianity is a chore, not a joy. For many Christians, it is hard. And ultimately, it is hard to please God. Now, again, we don't say that because it doesn't sound very nice. And we wouldn't want somebody to think uh, uh, ill of us. But here are two reasons you should do your own self-introspection and your own self-examination. Uh, maybe three reasons. Number one, if you don't acknowledge it and admit it, you can't solve it. If you want to own the fact that you got a problem, you can't fix the problem. So you got to own it if it's true. Number two, you already know in your heart, whether anybody ever knows how you feel about God, you know. The truth of the matter is, you know what every day is like for you in this Christian walk. You know whether it's a struggle. You know whether or not you believe God is hard. If nobody else knows it, you know it. Number three, God knows it. While somehow we move him out of our minds on this discussion, the truth of the matter is, he knows what we think of him. He knows what I felt about him. He knows it. And as I was working through the book and writing things and then reading what I wrote, I said, wow, God knew I felt that way about him. And it wasn't always good. It wasn't. I think I said at one point in the book that Christianity for me was a struggle and it was a struggle mightily. I mean, I worried and had angst and had problems and struggled. It was indeed a chore. This man can relate. I don't know if that's you, but I know it's him. Now, this man says that, and I'm going to tell you he's wrong. And I was wrong. Why is he wrong? Well, most of the answers to the Bible questions are in the place that you're reading. The truth is, you don't have to leave. A lot of times you start one place reading the Bible and you go to try to prove something and you jump to another place. Well, generally speaking, wherever you are, both the questions and the answers are there. How do I know this man is wrong? I don't actually have to go anywhere else. I just have to read the parable and I can see that. Begin with me at verse number 14. Why is he wrong? Verse number 14 says, it is just as a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Stop. They belong to him, number one. But what did he give them? The Bible says he gave them or he entrusted to them his own possessions. He doesn't owe them that. He trusts them. This is not an individual who is going to look for failure then. 
If you trust someone and you entrust someone, you aren't setting them up for failure. That's not the goal of trust and entrusting. But go on and keep reading. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. He went on his journey. How else do I know he's not hard? Well, verse number two says how he distributed the goods. How did he give out his money? Number one, the Bible says to one man he gave five. To another man he gave two, and to another man he gave one. Now, I might not understand that if I didn't have the rest of the verse, but the rest of the verse tells me how and why he did that. It says he distributed them according to each man's ability. Question, who knows their ability? The very master who's distributing the goods. It's because he knows his servants as to why this man got five. What he knows about that man is he can handle five. He gives the man two because he knows that man can handle two. The one is not punishment. It's because I know you can handle one. And so I give you one. In fact, one of the things that tells me is there is no servant of the master who got zero. Everybody has ability to do something. Sometimes we compare ourselves by ourselves, which is the wrong thing to do. There is no comparison between servants, but each servant has ability. You can see the difference between the talents and the ability. The talent belongs to the master, it's money but he gives it according to each servant's ability. They brought the ability, it's in them. And he gives out the goods accordingly. If this man were hard and difficult and wanted to see his servants fail, how could he have given out the goods? Well, he could have handled it. Absolutely, he could have just swapped it. He could have said, I know you're going to fail and I can't wait. And because I know you can only handle one, I'm gonna give you five. <laughs> Woo, and I can't wait to get you. He didn't do that. He gave to each man according to his own ability. The man who got one could handle one. The man who's got five is not better than the man who got one. They're all equal servants. They could just have different abilities. But let's keep reading. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. He who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came and brought up five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. How do we know he's not hard? The very next verse. His master said to him, Well done. Good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many or much. When the master distributes the blessings, the blessings are out of balance with the work he received. Let me explain. He gave one man five talents. That man brought back five more. The Greek word for you have been faithful over a few things. It's the idea of puny, small. You've not done much. But he says, I will give you much or many. That word, I believe, is the word megas. It is huge in proportion. You've done a little. I'm going to bless you with much. Is this the actions of a hard man? His blessings are disproportionate to the service he received. You've only been faithful over a little. I want to give you much. But that wasn't just for the man who received five. You see, when the man who received two came, verse number uh, 21, uh, or verse number uh, 22, the wall saw the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I've gained two more talents. His master said to him, what did he say to him? He said the same thing. 
Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little or a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Let me ask you a question. What do you think the man who received one talent would have heard if he had brought just one more back? Is he a hard man? There's nothing in this text that would indicate all of his actions are contrary to being hard. Now, that master, or that servant rather, thought he was hard. You'll notice that the master says two things to the faithful servants. He doesn't just call them faithful. What else does he call them? He calls them good and faithful. Listen to his language about this one talent man. Verse 24, the one who also had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you. And do you find it interesting that he's the only one who said so? The man who got five didn't say, I know you. The man who got two didn't say, I knew you. This is the only man who says, I knew you. What did he know about the master? I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not steeped. You know, the truth of the matter is not only is the master hard, then the master is dishonest. You're not supposed to reap where you haven't sown. That's not how it works. No, you reap what you sow. You have no right to reap if you don't sow. But he says of his master, you reap where you haven't sown. That's not right. Not only are you hard, man, character's not right. You reap where you have not sown. You gather where you have gathered. You gather where you have scattered no seed. He says in verse 25, and I was afraid. I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Now note the Lord's or the master's words to that servant. But his master answered and said unto him, it's not good and faithful. It's wicked and slothful or lazy. Now, why does he call him those two things? There's good and faithful and there's wicked and lazy. It sounds like in verse 26, the master agrees with him. You read the rest of the verse. It says, you knew that I reap where I did not sow. You gather where I scattered no seed. I read that for a while and I thought that doesn't make any sense because if that's what you are, then he has you pegged right. The truth of the matter is I had it wrong. The master is not agreeing with the servant's assessment. What he's explaining is your actions don't follow your assessment of me. It's more akin to saying, if you thought that was the way I was, then verse 27 explains, then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Here is the, the thing for us. If we think wrong about God, we will be like this servant. We will think him to be hard. And as a result of that, we will be afraid. It's not the word fear in the proper biblical sense of awe and reference. It's not that. This would be the word describing fright, angst, horror. I was afraid of you. I didn't fear you reverently. I was afraid, terrified of you. What did that make me do? I took that which was yours and I hid it in the earth. Well, why would I do that? I was so afraid of failing that I didn't do anything. Some people, when we are afraid of God in this way, if we aren't careful, we will act like this man and hide our ability to serve the Lord. In fact, that fear will often cause us to do nothing. You ever notice how often preachers stand up and encourage members, sometimes yell at members to read their Bibles? You study the Bible. You need to read the Bible. You need to be at services. You need to do this. You need to do that. And very often, Christians don't. Now, I don't mean to say that Christians don't because they have bad hearts, because I don't believe that for a second. But after a while, Christians are so afraid of failing, they just give up trying. And oftentimes what ends up happening is they end up doing less because of that fear. And if they do read the Bible, it might be, it's on my nightstand table. I've gone through my day. I'm tired now. I really want to go to sleep, but I see my Bible looking at me and I didn't open it today. I can't go to bed without that. So I'll crack it somewhere, read a few pages. You ever fell asleep reading the Bible? 
<laughs> well, you didn't think it was boring. That's not what it was. You were just tired. But out of fear, sometimes we just make sure we check the box. We make sure we do it. Now, reading the Bible like that won't actually help benefit you much because you won't have any systematic approach to study. You won't remember what you... No, if you're going to read the Bible, go ahead and read it. If you're going to study the Bible, that's more involved. And you need to set then a time and a place to try to be consistent and maybe block mm -hmm. off a half hour at a time and do it with purpose and rhyme and reason and get you some tools and some background information and work on a particular character or book or chapter or some theme. That's study if that's what you're going to do. But the reason Christians don't is because they're like this man. Most of them live in fear most of the time. And they're afraid. They think God is hard. Now, they're doing 15 other things just the way God would want them to do it. But not this one. They get up in the morning with their families. They're providing. They go to work. They love their wife or their husband. They are faithful to God in their business and in their practices. They try to rear their children in harmony with the Lord, and bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They attend the services. They're trying to live the life. That's who they are. But when it comes to God and studying his word and knowing him, well, I'm just afraid of failing. And so oftentimes, do I share the gospel? Well, no, I know I need to, but man, I just, I don't know enough. I'm not good enough. I might not say it wrong. I could mess this thing up so bad. What ends up happening is they find themselves doing less and less and less and less and less. Great on some things, fearful and afraid on others. The reason Jesus calls this man wicked is because this man doesn't act in harmony with his profession. He says, I knew you to be hard. Well, Jesus' response to that is, of all the people in the world then, you should have been doing the most. Because if you thought that when I arrived, I was going to punish you, shouldn't you have wanted to avoid punishment? But the fact that you hid it in the earth and did nothing belies the fact that what you're saying, you don't actually believe. That's the Lord's position. And this is where great many people of the Lord's people live. Now, in the time we have left, which is absolutely zero at this point. <laughs> so we'll come back tomorrow, Lord's will. Are there any questions? Let me give you a couple of things to read, and then we'll come back tomorrow. We'll pick up our next study. Along this study, let me give you some passages. How about Hosea 4, uh, verses 1 to 6? And then Micah 6, 6 through 8, if you'll read those, the point of those passages simply to illustrate God's people have struggled with this for some time. And those people in the Old Testament struggle with it too, and we continue to struggle with it in the New Testament. What were they again? Repeat it. Oh, I'm sorry. Hosea for Hosea 4, 1 to 6. I apologize. And Micah 6, 6 through 8. And, and, and we'll come back. We'll touch on those in the morning. And then we'll jump into what God says about himself. And what the scripture begins to paint of God, about God. And I'll suggest to you a new way to read the Bible. We'll do that tomorrow morning, Lord's will. Yes, sir. You want to listen to some word of prayer? Father, we thank you for the time we've had to come together to study your word. We're thankful, Father, for the time that we have. We can get together as brothers and sisters. We can better serve you, better know your word, Father. We can do better in this life, preparing our lives now for the life to come. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you give us each day, but most of all for thy son, Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. You know, I was thinking about your lesson last night.